now the word of God from the Gospel of Matthew. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had left the Sadducees speechless, they met together. One of them, a legal expert, tested him. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You must love your neighbor as you love yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. In response to the word that we just heard, we're going to sing a scriptural song that uses the scripture for next week. It comes from Psalm 119. I'll sing it once and invite you to sing it back to me. It's super simple. Your words are sweeter than honey on our lips. Sweeter than honey on our lips are your words. Try that with me. Ready? Your words are sweeter than honey on our lips. Sweeter than honey on our lips are You got it. Let's sing it three more times. Here we go. Your words are sweeter than honey on our lips, sweeter than honey on our lips are your words. Your words are sweeter than honey on our lips, sweeter than honey on our lips are your words. One more time, one more time. Your words are sweeter than honey on our lips, sweeter than honey on our lips are your Oftentimes we are told as United Methodists that we don't know the Bible. And so we struggle sometimes to be able to respond to people in the midst of moments where there seems to be discussion going on. And we tend to pull back from that. And yet last week Marcus lifted up to you as we talked about taking Jesus' Bible seriously, which was in reference to the Hebrew text, the Old Testament as we know it as Christians, that it's important for us to look at the Scripture, through Scripture, through reason, and through tradition. That part of the struggle is that oftentimes we debate about how we interpret Scripture, to take it literally or Do we take it as a greater truth? Is it the word of God or is it the words of God? And what Marcus lifted up to you last week was that we as United Methodists don't interpret it literally. We interpret it as the word of God, the truth offered to us through God's people. And so as we begin to turn our attention this week to taking the church's Bible seriously. And what that means is that we're focused then on what we refer to as the New Testament. Beginning at the Gospels, going through Revelation, I invite us to turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, inspire us with your true and lively word that we may know more of what it means to be your children and that we may faithfully respond to the call of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one in whose name we've gathered and the one in whose name we pray this day. Amen. It was 1979 down in Miami and Hurricane David was approaching. Max Licato would say that he was living on a houseboat during that time period. He's says I'm not real sure why I was living on a houseboat during that time, but it seemed like an adventure at the time. He got a little more adventure than he bargained for. He and his friends, as they watched all the reports, and Hurricane David was headed straight at them. Now, they were on the Miami River, and so what they began to do was they decided that they needed to buy as much rope as possible. And so they went and secured as much rope as possible, and they tied it as tight as they could from the boat to the shoreline and to any tree that they could find nearby. And there was somebody who, well, he'd been on the river a little longer than Max Licato. And as he was walking by and watching them, he said, would you like some advice? 
And they said, well, sure. And he said, you're tying it to all the wrong things. If you tie it that tight to these trees and to the shoreline, eh, it's going to get ripped to pieces as those trees get blasted by the hurricane. He said, what you really have to do, you have to move it out a little bit into the water, and you have to let the ropes go loose, and you have to anchor deep. Anchor deep. I think that's what Jesus is saying in the midst of the scripture today. I think he is responding to the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and those are two religious groups during the time. And what you need to know is they didn't agree with each other, and yet they had come together, and throughout the chapter, they keep asking Jesus questions. They keep asking him questions to see if they can catch him in something. You know friends who maybe do that sometimes, or they ask you a question and really want you to respond a certain way. And it's one of those where in the midst of this, Jesus looks at them and says, let me tell you the most important thing. All the law and the prophets is what he says. Everything from the Hebrew text. And the way in which I live my life and the teachings I have and what I understand the very nature of God to be, Jesus says comes down to two things. Love God and love your neighbor. Love God and love your neighbor. I think what Jesus was saying was, you're tying to the wrong things, and if you're going to anchor deep, you need to anchor deep in love. And you need to anchor deep in the understanding that God, God's love for you runs deep. And that the response for that is not only loving God, but it's loving those people that God has placed with us in the journey. And so how do we do that? How do we anchor deep? Because what I'm going to tell you is I think more often than not, as Christians, I think the debates that keep rising up in our world today, I think the debates that we continue to have, I think the concern about any fracturing that's happening in churches or along any walls, it's one of those where I think over and over again in our world, in our country, and in the church, it is because we keep tying our ropes too tight to the wrong things. And we forget what it means to anchor deep. Anchoring deep means that when we look at the scripture, we look at the whole of it. From creation all the way through to the end of Revelation. It doesn't mean picking out one verse that says something about what I want it to say. It means how do we take the whole the whole of the scripture. Now, what I need to tell you is that we are gifted in that we have the ability to have the whole book before us. That's only been in the last 500 years that that's been possible because well, it was around that time that the printing press came about. And that gave us the ability to actually have it in this form that we could what well, we could take home with us or study in groups. Because prior to that, well, how many of y'all know how to read Hebrew? We have some Greek scholars. Any of y'all read Latin really well? It's one of those where that was pretty much the option. And so the only people who had access were the scholars who could read Hebrew, Greek, or Latin. And they then told everybody what it said. But we have the gift. And next week, third graders, we're going to give you the gift of the Bible. Because we believe that we really are called to read it. And not just to read it, but to really allow it to begin to sink in. Not so that we can memorize it. I need to be clear about that. It's not so we can memorize verse by verse. And that's where we get in trouble. When people start asking us questions, we think, oh, I need to be able to quote something. No, really what we need to be able to say is, this is a book about God's faithfulness and God's love for us. And God does that through covenant from the very beginning of creation all the way through. 
Every time people, God's children, turn away from God, God continues to call them back. God hears our cries. God listens and cares. God acts and God saves. That's the gift we have today. And so as we turn toward the New Testament, we open it and we find the Gospels. Four accounts of Jesus' life, Jesus' teachings. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. None of them are exactly the same. They all share a different perspective. And so we could tie our ropes to the details of all of those stories and debate which one is, which one is the facts, which one is correct. Or we could begin to look at the whole of the story. You know, Jesus didn't come to write a book. That wasn't his purpose. Jesus even didn't come so that other people would write a book about him. Jesus came to be fully in relationship with you and with me so that we could have a greater relationship with God. And so we got to get back to the understanding of what, then what does Jesus' relationships look like? And you know what they look like? They look like when the children are all running up to Jesus and the disciples are going, yep, nope, we're too busy, you can't be doing that, and he sends them away. Jesus says, no, let the children come to me. Jesus forms a community of disciples where Jesus says, it's okay to question. It's okay to struggle. It's okay to be honest about your doubts and your struggles because that's how we own our faith. That's why we do confirmation the way we do in our church. Because we want youth to be able to struggle and to challenge, to ask questions and to own their faith for themselves. That's what we hope we all continue to do all the way through life. How did Jesus respond to the outcast? those who were on the fringes, those who had been told they were unclean, those who had been told they weren't wanted anymore, Jesus welcomed them. Jesus touched them. Jesus offered healing for their brokenness. Y'all, that tells us how we're supposed to respond to one another. To anchor deep means to anchor in not only love for God, but love for those around us. And yet too often we get... We start anchoring and tying our ropes really tight to all the things that the world tells us is important. And you know when we realize it's not? Times like when the floodwaters rise. And neighbors who didn't know each other suddenly become really good friends in a boat because they're trying to get out. And in the midst of those moments, what I need to tell you is every time I saw a report of people piling in the boats, I saw them carrying like one bag with them, but I didn't see anybody kicking everybody else out of the boat saying, you know what, I've got to pull down my, all my stuff. All my stuff's really important right now. I need to get it all in the boat so nobody else can get in it. Did y'all see any of that happening in Houston? No. People were welcoming one another into the boat, regardless, regardless of race, regardless of age, regardless of political affiliation, regardless of faith, regardless of culture, all people were into the boat together. And Jesus says, it's then that we start realizing what we really need to anchor to. All that other stuff, suddenly, it doesn't matter a whole lot, does it? And then we get, after the Gospels, we get into this, the group of letters. Letters. 
after the history of Acts that sort of tells an outline of why we have the letters that we have. And there's 21 letters. 13 are written by a man named Paul or accredited to Paul. Paul was Saul prior to that. And what you need to know about Saul is Saul was one of those that had tied his rope so tight to the laws that he really had a hard time letting go. And he had tied it so tight that he was the one who stood at the stoning of Stephen. He was out persecuting those who were saying that they believed another way. And so what had to happen before Saul, who became Paul, could live into a new way of living through his experience of meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus? When his life had changed, he had to go back to those same people he was persecuting. And they had to work through forgiveness for him. They had to welcome him in. You know, that's tough stuff. But it was only then that he was sent out, not just with God's blessings, but their blessings. And so he'd go and start new churches. And when he'd start a new church, he'd get a leadership team together. And then he'd leave that church and go start another one, and he'd write letters back to that church about a specific thing, about specific problems, about specific instances that were going on in those churches. And y'all, when we read the letters of not just Paul, but all 21, you need to know that we are reading somebody else's mail. Because what began to happen was the churches, well, they began to feel like that there was truth in those, so they began to pass them around. And they became part of the New Testament. But it gets a little tricky. And I want to tell you how it gets tricky. If you are a parent, some of y'all have more than one kid maybe in your home, or you have a sibling. And what I would tell you is that me and my sister are very different from each other. And so I have four kids. All of them are very different. Now, if two kids came to their parents and said, you know, we really value We value what you have to say. We want some guidance from you. Would you write down some words of wisdom for us? I want you to imagine that one of those children coming is a child that, well, has always been very goal-oriented, has always had a plan in place, strives towards perfection more often than not, graduated college in three years, is already working 70 plus hours in a job and has the plan laid out from now till eternity about how their world is gonna go. I want you to imagine the other child that has come to their parent asking for this and that child, well, is more free-spirited, imaginative, loves to travel, decided, well, school wasn't really for them. And that child loves to just hang out with friends and be in relationships. Now, as the parents write their advice to both children, do you think the letters are going to sound the same? Probably not. They may both start with how much they love them. But somewhere in there, this child over here that is so goal-oriented, that is working 70-plus hours, that only can see success down the road as step one, step two, step three, probably the parent's going to write something like, you need, it might be good to like take a breath every so often, to stop and smell the roses, to think about, well, to think about what are some things you might do for fun every so often. And for the other child, they might say, we love your creativity. We love your free spirit. You know, in order to pay for some of those things, And is there truth in both letters? Yes. Profound, infinite truth in both letters. But they were written for a specific time, for a specific purpose. The letters that we find in the New Testament are the same. They have profound truth in them. But if we tie the ropes of faith to a few verses here and there, then we have lost the lens which Jesus gave us of loving God and loving our neighbor. The book of Revelation is the one that more people than not wanted to not include in the New Testament. There was great debate over it. And what I will tell you is a lot of 
people choose not to really get into Revelation a whole lot because, well, it just, it feels difficult and sometimes people just get scared of all the imagery that's in there. But I wanna tell you that I believe that Revelation is a book of hope. It was a book of hope for the early church and it's a book of hope for us today. It's a book of hope in the midst of times of earthquakes and hurricanes and wildfires. It's a book that says that God is faithful, not just in the past and not just in the present, but that God will be faithful all the way to the end and that there is always hope beyond what we see in our present circumstances. To anchor deep means to anchor into that hope. this gift of this book. It's not something we need to worship. But it is a tool, a tool that opens to us an understanding of the very nature of God. God's love for God's people. It's a book that reminds us that there is hope in the midst of of the darkest of times. It is a book that reminds us that God offers new life out of death over and over again. It is a book that tells us that God's light shines when darkness seems to envelop us. It is a book that tells of God's love for God's people. And it's a book that challenges us. Challenges us to respond by not only loving God, but doing that in such a way that we live in love. In a depth of doing good unto one another. That's how we anchor deep.